Welcome back to the Surface Design Symposium. For many of you who have joined us for multiple sessions, we are so excited that you are here with us and excited that you're here for this particular session, which is about growing your surface design business in collaboration with interior designers. Um, I'm sure some of this information is gonna be a repeat for all of you, but bear with me. My name is Jesse Katz Greenberg. I'm the artist community manager here at Spoonflower. And I'm really excited to again, have had the opportunity to partner with Abby and Craft Industry Alliance to bring you this event. I hope that it has been bringing you a lot of inspiration and information that you can use to start or grow your surface design business. I want to share a little bit about our presenters today, Spoonflower and Craft Industry Alliance. Spoonflower is a print-on-demand platform and manufacturer of wallpaper, fabric, and home decor. Our online global marketplace connects makers, consumers, and interior designers with independent artists all over the world who earn royalties every time their designs are purchased. Any artist can set up shop at spoonflower.com now to start or grow their surface design business. And as I've done in every session, I want you to pop into the chat and let me know if you already have a Spoonflower shop. Let's see how many artists we've got here with us today. And as I mentioned, this symposium is being co-presented by Craft Industry Alliance. Craft Industry Alliance is a community for creative professionals. You can get expert trainings like those you'll see here today, plus become part of a vibrant creative community for advice and support. We have a special coupon code to share with you today for participants in today's session. You can use the code Surface Design 2023. We'll be sure to save that, to share that in chat um, to save 20% on your membership through October 13th at craftindustryalliance.org. Um, if we have any Craft Industry Alliance members here, please let us know in chat as well. We'd love to welcome you. All right, let's get some simple housekeeping things out of the way before we begin. I've got our friends Catherine and Emily from the Spoonflower team helping to moderate behind the scenes today. So say hi to Catherine in chat and we have Emily in the Q&A. Um, they'll be helping to address any, um, any of your questions. They're gonna kind of field some questions in the chat share some links so you can learn more about our panelists. And also I'm going to be taking some questions from Q&A live with our panelists. So we do have some questions prepared, um, but we really look forward to taking your questions as well. As you can see, there's a lot of people here and the chat is moving fast. So if you do have questions for our panelists, make sure you drop those in the Q&A tool specifically. Um, that will be the best place for me to notice them while I'm moderating so I can make sure we answer as many of them as possible in this hour, which I'm sure is going to go by so quickly. All right, so before we dive into the topic of growing your surface design business, with interior designers, I want to get to know our panelists a little bit better. So we're gonna start with some introductions. Um, so Kim, why don't you kick us off? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, hi, I'm Kim Armstrong. I own Kim Armstrong Interior Design. I'm a um, interior design firm based in Dallas, Texas. And I um, went to school for interior design, but it's not what I always knew what I wanted to do. I was in kinesiology for a bit. And I literally thought I was going to flunk college with three days in anatomy. So I looked through the syllabus and I said, what is it that I think I could just pass college? And I landed on the interior design program and it's stuck. And I'm um, over 20 years into my own business. And um, so that's how I came here. And I am a self-professed um, textile snob. Um, so I love great textiles. And then I started collaborating with Spoonflower and I fell in love with what you could do working with individual artists. In the background is an entire Spoonflower room behind me, except for the solid white and the blue, but all those other prints are Spoonflower and I just love it. So thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. Um, Ebony, let's hear from you next. Tell us a little bit about yourself. 
Okay, hello everyone. My name is Ebony Staten. I am the principal designer and owner of The Vogue Room here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And The Vogue Room is a small boutique interior design studio here where we specialize in residential spaces. And aside from that, um, I have a nonprofit in which that's called The Vogue Room Foundation. And um, essentially we provide minority first generation college students with their transition into their um, university living. And that consists of a dorm room makeover. And so the picture behind me, um, we collaborated with Spoonflower this summer, decorating three dorm rooms and um, absolutely love it. So, and great to work with. So. Awesome. Welcome, Ebony. And Shelly, introduce yourself. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Shelly Turner. Uh, some of you know me as Shelly Turner Designs on Spoonflower, formerly Cooper and Craft, which was actually named after one of my little fluffies, Cooper. Um, yeah. My background is in interior and architectural design. I have a bit of a more heavy background in the architecture side than the interior design side, even though that's my degree. Um, during COVID, uh, because I have some underlying health condition issues, I was a little afraid to be out as much, which I'm sure some of you can understand as well. And so I decided because the construction industry had really just gone up in smoke during that time, uh, the stress was not good for me. So I decided to pick back up with my background as well in some fine art and design and hadn't picked up a brush or pen in quite a while, but with my husband's uh, encouragement did that. And now Spoonflower is actually my 100% full-time uh, gig and I absolutely love it and working with interior designers is 100% in my wheelhouse and it's one of my favorite things to do working with architects and interior designers. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. We are so lucky to have the three of you here with your varied experiences and I'm really excited to dive into today's topic. Um, so we are sharing a lot of resources in chat today, which you, I'm sure you're seeing all those links. We are going to share all of these resources with the replay. So if you miss any portion of the session live today or you miss opening up one of those links, don't worry, we're going to get all of that to you um, next week. All right. So let's start diving in. Oh, and if you have any questions for Shelly, Ebony, or Kim throughout this, um, please go ahead and drop them in Q&A and I'll make sure to surface them mixed in with some of our planned questions. All right. Um, so let's get started. Interior designers really are a huge market for surface pattern design. So let's start by explaining how maybe you've worked with interior designers, or if you're an interior designer, how you've worked with a surface design artist and what those projects have entailed. Uh, so Shelly, do you wanna take this from the artist perspective? Sure, and I can actually take you through a tiny bit of, uh, when I was still running my own design studio here in North Carolina, um, I had come from a background in commercial design and then switched to residential when I ran my own studio. And so the fun of that was, of course, more um, interesting spaces where everybody's personality flows in, of course, as your clients. And so wallpaper was an awesome thing to add into projects, especially in powder rooms or uh, foyers or spaces that the clients really kind of wanted a statement or a little pop. The other great thing is that wallpaper actually protects your walls. So if you have some high traffic areas in your home or your office or any other spaces, wallpaper is actually a fantastic uh, implementation. So I started out by offering to my design clients that I could help them design a custom wallpaper for their project. And that was really fun, of course. A lot of my clients came from the equestrian world. Um, I'm also a horseback rider. And so it just was this awesome symbiotic relationship between myself and my clients. So I've got some like horsey themed wallpapers in homes around the area and restaurants and other things like that. Uh, the other great thing was that um, scalability of the print per project was a very important nuance as well. So I'm sure Ebony and Kim would agree that there's so many tiny fine details in interior design and for the designer to execute the project beautifully, there are scales on textiles, on wallpapers, uh, 
on your marble slabs or your granite slabs, whatever you have. And all of that comes together cohesively in order to create this beautiful art piece, basically, which is your interior. Um, so we have done a lot of custom, or I have done a lot of custom colorways and other things to match to like a vintage piece that maybe a designer has procured for their client um, or a, another fabric from like one of the big trade companies and such. So it's it's really a rewarding uh, route to go for both the interior designer and the surface pattern designer. If you have a little bit of experience in design already, it makes that process a whole lot easier from the surface design perspective. But the designer, if you click with them, especially style-wise, they can help you to uh, bring out what they're looking for as well. Awesome. That's a great tip about really clicking with your clients and who you're working with. And I love that you have such a specific niche also with the horse lovers. If anyone does not follow Shelly on Instagram, she shared a fantastic blooper of her promo video for this event with her horse over her shoulder, just dropping hay on her. And so she talked about the symposium. It was great. Um, Kim, do you want to share from a little bit more from the interior designers. Yeah, person. absolutely. So um, as an interior designer, you know, um, I, usually I start a project with textiles and patterns and I organize the color. So I'll come back with like bags of samples and fabrics, or I'll create like tons of boards of like patterns that I like um, and sort through and like, you know, go, this goes on the sofa, this goes on this. And what's great about Spoonflower have collaborated, um, not just in the room that you see behind me, but I did one project where I had all my beautiful textiles and fabrics and we needed a massive volume of window treatments. Like, I think we needed like 60 or 65 yards of, of, fabric to to do the window treatments on it and it was just finding the specific print in the specific size and the specific colorway and it was a really unusual colorway that I was putting together so I actually collaborated with an artist on um, spoon flower and she did a custom color for me and scaled it and uh, we went through two or three different revisions and we got samples and then finally the client approved it and it just turned out so gorgeous so it was such a nice thing that I could say I love this pattern and but these are the colors that I need and that's the beautiful thing about spoon flowers that you can actually do that in a way that's going to be affordable for a project versus you know going somewhere else and spending thousands of dollars on trying to recreate this look and that you can develop a personal relationship with a designer on Spoonflower and it's great. And then this, you know, almost every single pattern you see behind me is from Spoonflower. So just another example of pulling a room together using, um, you know, fabrics that artists have designed, which is really cool. Awesome. Um, and let's see, building off of this, what should surface design artists be considering or why should service design artists be considering the interior design world as a potential market? What are some of those advantages? Um, Kim, you touched on this a bit. Is there anything you'd like to expand on in this? So the, um, yes. And I was just, I was, we had chatted earlier and Shelly had a great um, thing. So maybe she should start and let me. Absolutely. Compound on hers. Sure. Oh, Go sure. for it, Kelly. Um, so marketing to interior designers is one of the most fantastic ways to get your prints and patterns out into the world. There, of course, are clients who uh, make their interior designers either sign something or say they don't want photos shared or whatnot. Some that's understandable. Not every client wants their information shared, but for the clients that do and the designers that are able to, they will typically have a professional photographer come in and photograph the uh, final space. So it's all put together. It's kind of a reveal situation. And the designer usually is the one that has staged the space with decoration to make it look as editorial and beautiful as possible. So the designs you see in magazines are typically situations like that. Um, or like Kim's behind her, Ebony's behind her. They're very staged and beautiful. They look like they came out of a magazine. And so when customers who aren't designers, who are maybe design clients or just 
your average person, um, which is most of us, uh, they see something in a photo and they think, oh my gosh, that is so beautiful. Where did that come from? In a lot of magazines, they'll have resources listed at the back of the magazine. Sometimes down below, they'll talk about what the wallpaper is or the drapery fabric and whatnot. And so your brand or your name is out there in a lot of ways for free or you've basically gotten paid to have your images out there because they purchased your product and you didn't have to pay as the designer for your um, photos or exposure or anything. The interior designer has done that for you. And so it's a fantastic way to really get your yourself on a higher level, more upscale, appropriate look to the industry, which designers share information all the time. So once one designer uses something, usually they're sharing it with multiple other designers because it's a very tight knit community. And it's just, it's a fantastic way to, yeah. to kind of launch yourself into the world. Shelly, I'm going to expand on that. Um, what you said too is as, as, as interior designers, we so love and appreciate the um, other artists that help us make our work look good. And so mm -hmm. recently we just had an installation, I think it was a week or two ago. And so I went ahead and tagged all the Spoonflower designers that we use on my Instagram page. And I don't have a ton, I'm trying to get to 4,000, but just think like that's 4,000 people that just saw your work that had never seen your work before, you know? And um, not only that, but the other thing about connecting with interior designers and developing a relationship with interior designers is that we're not like DIY homeowners where they might have a project, they might buy some yardage from you, but they're probably not doing project after project after project. So that's why getting in with the interior designers is great because that's what we do all day long. It's like, we're constantly creating projects, grabbing fabrics, grabbing textiles, grabbing wallpaper, um, making pillows, everything. And so we're doing that, you know, 40 plus hours a week for our clients. And so if you can get a relationship with somebody that that or for me, somebody I really love working with, and I know they're easy and they're responsive, and I love their work that they do. I'm going to be very likely to keep bringing them on to other projects. So that's another good way that collaboration with an interior designer is great um, for um, the textile designer. Awesome. I'm sure everyone out there is taking a bunch of notes. I'm over here wanting to take notes while we're talking, and I'm having to restrain myself. This is great. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and just, just piggyback yeah, what, what yeah. Kim said. So, you know, like as an interior designer, I definitely foresee an increasing trend where interior designers and surface designers collaborating and creating like really bespoke fabrics, wallpapers, pillows, like you name it. Um, because, you know, just an example, like, you know, throughout my interior design career, and I don't know if interior designers here can attest to this, but, you know, we countless, we, we go into wallpaper stores all the time. And, you know, you just like kind of get defeated because you're looking at the same books, the same patterns. And it's like, you know, you want something new, you want something fresh. And um, I definitely uh, will be collaborating with the surface designer really soon. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so we have a question in chat from Elizabeth and Kim, I think this would be a great one for you. Um, are there any communities of interior designers that surface design artists could look to, to join and meet and form those relationships? Like what are those best ways to find interior designers to collect? Yeah. So there's, there's, um, two that I can think of, um, Right off the bat, there's ASID, which is American Society of Interior Design. They have a national organization. There's um, probably an organization in most of your areas um, relatively close. And then there's also another one that's IDS. And that's um, a collaboration of interior designers and interior decorators that is, that is great too. So that is a great place to start for organizations. Um, if you wanted to just start locally, um, that might be a good way for you to kind of research local designers that maybe you offer, hey, let me bring you lunch. Let me bring you a sampling of my um, things. We're super busy, but we always love a free meal. Um, so <laughs> if you could stop by, you know, so a lot of designers off, mm -hmm. office out of their house, their small boutique, I used to for over a decade. Um, I do have an office space now, but, um, you know, bring their small team of uh, sandwiches from Jimmy John's or something was great and just sit down and have a chance to 
um, show them what you can do. But I also would be make sure that your work is in alignment with their work. So if you're mm -hmm. um, super like neutral and tribal and you have that aesthetic, like you probably wouldn't approach somebody whose website looks may maybe like what my room looks like behind me. Right. So make sure that your as design aesthetic is in alignment with the person that you want to approach, because that's how you really create like genuine um, relationships. And also there is um, IIDA, which I saw somebody had mentioned in the comments as well. So for our international friends out there, IIDA is a fantastic resource because that's the International uh, Interior Design Association. And with ASID, IDS, IIDA, most of these organizations have local chapters. And so you can really get a good foothold into the industry as a surface pattern designer by either joining them as in like an associate or uh, like in alliance with essentially. Um, so ASID is a good example of that and IDS as well. You can basically be an industry partner and it does cost a little bit of money, but then you are part of a directory that is showcased immediately to interior designers within that area or like I, IIDA, you reach people from all over the world. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I see a, a great question from Rachel in the Q&A. As interior designers, do you primarily find artists for your projects via Spoonflower or are there other platforms and ways you like to connect with artists as well? And this kind of comes back to something else we wanted to talk about, which is um, how do you recommend maybe participating in industry trade shows like High Point, where you're likely to meet interior designers and artists? Um, so Ebony, do you want to start with this one? Yeah, so I would highly recommend um, surface designers to go to High Point uh, Furniture Market or any other trade shows. I'm in North Carolina, like an hour away from High Point. So I'm a habitual uh, <laughs> attendee, um, been to over 12. So I've been going since, since 2016. And every time I go, it's a different experience and different um, added value to my overall interior career. And so um, I definitely recommend just because of the exposure along, you know, those the markets and the trade shows, you, you come in contact with thousands of interior designers, thousands of, you know, people in the home decor industry, hospitality, and, you know, just a great networking opportunity. But, you know, the primary reason why I go to market and um, trade shows is because of product visibility, you know, so we want to engage with the product, you know, I want to see it, I want to touch it, I want to sit on it, you know, and, um, and for surface um, designers, you know, on the flip side of that, you know, participating in the trade shows, I think that you'll get a get, get great feedback, you know, as far as real time feedback on your product. So I think it's a good opportunity. Awesome. Um, Shelly, do you want to add about trade shows or about ways that, um, well, you from the artist side, you know, platforms that you've connected with interior designers from. Yeah, absolutely. So High Point Market, like Ebony said, is incredible. It's an international market. Uh, North Carolina was considered the furniture capital of the world for quite a long time. Um, our history is in textiles and furniture as well. And market brings tens of thousands of people twice a year to see the latest from manufacturers and uh, other like antiques markets and other things like that. Um, having a physical booth at High Point might not be a cost-effective option for maybe the majority of us, uh, although a group of people could probably go in on something. But also another way around that is, uh, for example, in the antiques market section of High Point, I have seen uh, small artisans put their wares in somebody else's booth. So I imagine they probably just pay a small fee to that particular booth's owner. And then they're able to have a, a small section that's either integrated into the other booth's items or it's just their own little small section. And that seems to work out really well. It gets them the exposure that they need uh, without having to spend thousands of dollars, which is likely what it costs to have a high point booth. Um, there's other market things that you can do. Uh, like Kim said as well, designers are super busy all the time in their studios, whether it's a home studio or a physical brick and mortar. And if you just want to call them and schedule an appointment to 
basically showcase some of your work, put together a box or uh, a small portfolio of your work with some swatches. Uh, make sure you cut your swatches down so that they look nice and presentable. And um, then you can just kind of bring a smattery, smattering of things and showcase them to the designers. And again, bring snacks, like Kim said, snacks or maybe offer lunch, like uh, go to Panera and get like kind of the catering boxes from Panera or Starbucks or something like that. Um, it's a great way to keep your designers fed and happy. And also they'll remember you because you're, you're doing a kindness to them as well. And it keeps you in the forefront of their mind when they're specifying. Awesome. And, and I, have, I know, yeah, go ahead, Kim. <laughs> I have one more thing. The other thing that for exposure to designers is, you know, they have lots of show houses. Now, man, we probably all heard of Kips Bay, but even they have smaller local ones. And if you as an artist can approach the director of that and be like, hey, I have a textile artist. I'm willing to donate wallpaper for a room or this and let me know. Designers are always because they're super, super expensive, but it is a massive way to get big exposure. And it's all about the collaboration of the interior designer, but it's also the pro the people who donate products and um, things. And so it's a good way to get kind of get seen. Um, your work gets seen on a more in front of designers, but also even people that come to the show homes as well. Awesome. Um, so we've talked about how to connect with interior designers, but before we even get to that point, let's talk about the portfolio that we're putting together before we start meeting. Um, so Shelly, I'll let you take this one first. How do you create a portfolio that is appealing to the interior design industry? Are there specific prints or patterns or themes that this industry is looking for? And then related to that, how important are digital mock-ups in that process? Uh, yes. So the short answer is yes, every single bit of that is important. Um, one of the ways that non-interior design background uh, individuals can kind of level up their own surface pattern design is to you, you really have to always be doing continuing education. You have to always be looking at trends, even though trends are not necessarily what you or your style should follow. Uh, the number one rule I would say is to stay true to your own aesthetic mm -hmm. unless you are very beginner and you're still growing and trying to understand what that aesthetic is. I mean, keep playing. I'm still playing with things too. It's just fun. Um, but look at trade magazines. This one is an example is Frederick. Uh, this is the most gorgeous. Oh my gosh. I love this magazine so much. And there are Another thing that's great about magazines like this that are more trade focused or high end client focused is that you will see all the different brands and advertisements for luxury and high end um, manufacturers of other goods so that you can create nuances in your patterns that kind of play back to mm -hmm. things. So make sure again, that you're looking at trends within the design world or find your own aesthetic, like whether it's cottage or uh, country French or mid-century modern or whatnot, and, and do a lot of research, look at history about that design aesthetic. Um, so books, trade magazines, any interior design magazines, um, you can go on Google, obviously, and look up tons of things. Pinterest is also a great resource. And then when you're wanting to present to designers, uh, one of the newer things I'm actually doing in my studio here, because I'll be opening it up to local interior designers to come in and collaborate on uh, custom projects, is... When you're shopping online, for example, on Spoonflower, because it's a computer, you can't really see the exact color of what you're looking at. It might look a little bit more pink online and then you get it and it's more yellow or, or something like that. So one of the things that I'm slowly infusing into my own website and such is um, some little tip cards that I will scan or photograph, but I'll also have here for my local uh, design friends as well. And I've selected paint color chips that blend with the fabric swatch. So they might not be perfect matches because I didn't use hex codes for some of these, but they're colors that blend really, really well or are very close. And one of the hardest things for designers to be able to see on Spoonflower is what neutral ground color 
actually will work with their design. So for example, um, this is a Sherwin-Williams color chip and it's beige intenso and it happens to really blend and pick up on the, so this is a crane, you can't tell, it's just a part of the fabric. And it really blends with this neutral beigey color here. The thing that's so helpful about that is interior designers spend so much time selecting, reselecting. It, it's just time intensive. It takes away money from their project. So if they can go online, and this would be through my personal website, not through Spoon, Spoonflower, but they can go online and they can look at something like this and they can say, oh, I'm going to order that swatch because I know that this color blends with like the rug and the the other, the wood tones that I'm using in this project, for example. So creating, and, and I just did these at home. I mean, they're just easy to put together. I'll even put a little thing on my website to show people how easy it is to put something like this together. Um, you can get your paint chips for free at Lowe's, Ace, Home Depot, or you can go to Sherwin-Williams or Benjamin Moore. And a lot of times they'll give you a fan deck if you register as a designer, or you can purchase a fan deck. And if you don't know what a fan deck is, it looks like <laughs> this. So this happens to be a Benjamin Moore fan deck, and it just opens into this great compilation of color here. This is also a fantastic way for surface pattern designers to create their prints as well. So you would pull colors from the paint swatches that you see and then look up their hex codes online and interject that hex code digitally. Or if you're using hand painted or hand drawn, you can always try to match your paint mix to one of the paint colors and then scan it in. I love this. I love all the visuals that are going along with your tips. It makes Very it so visual. <laughs> I love it. Um, Ebony, I'm wondering if you want to share also um, from your perspective as an interior designer, what would you be looking for in a portfolio from a surface design artist? Are there specific prints and patterns, mock-ups, things like that? Yeah. So, I mean, so like currently, so my clients, it's kind of like, you know, I kind of do the work for them and then present it like options for them. But um, right now they're drawn to a lot of like black and white, because <laughs> it's on trend, mm -hmm. um, but like really oversized, um, like brush, brush, brush strokes and hand-drawn patterns and fabrics and wallpapers, especially, and also rugs. Um, and so, you know, like when mixing patterns, I feel as if sometimes, you know, sometimes my clients, they can't see the overall vision of everything. And so um, definitely putting it in a rendering would definitely help them um, see the overall vision of the room and also like the patterns and things like that. But, um, you know, collaborating with the surface designer, like to Shelly's point, um, I think the mock-ups is definitely needed so we can definitely see the overall vision. And also when it comes to presentation to your client, you want them to, um, you know, see it as well. So, yeah. Awesome. Here's a little example of a mock-up that I recently did to showcase one of my newer, it's hard to see on here, my newer uh, collections. Nice. And if you have some Photoshop skills, these are pretty easy to do. And it uses images from both Spoonflower's mock-ups as well as a little bit of my own because I don't want to have to reinvent the wheel. I want it to be easy. And you can just kind of make a compilation which showcases how your fabric prints or wallpaper prints could be utilized in a space. And that also gives the designers a really great reference point because as they're scrolling through social media or they're checking out your web page, they see that full image and they're like, oh, wow, I really love that. That really captures my aesthetic. I want to know more about what that is. Right. Yeah. Um, um, and Kim, was there anything you wanted to add to that as well from your point of view? Things yeah. That so I think I think it's great. So if you are wanting to collaborate with interior designers, because that's what this whole panel is about, think about how interior designers are going to use textiles in the room, right? So, and I'll give you a little bit of insight. So I usually start with my power, my power, um, my power pattern. And that's kind of where all the other patterns kind of stem from, right? So let's say I have a big organic um, print and it's got multiple different colors on it. Think about what's going to pair nicely with it. Maybe it's a more simple stripe and you might want to do that in a collection that you have and then make sure that the colors coordinate. The other thing is, is that I like to pair like organics with geometrics. So as you're doing designs and as you're presenting your textiles, it, it's really nice and it makes 
our job a lot easier to be able to be like, not have to go searching in other places to go find things that coordinate with your patterns. So being able to present to us like a beautiful composition of um, color palettes and patterns that blend beautifully together so that we can use those on different objects in a room is a great way to present to interior designers. So think of how a designer would use your patterns in a room and how the, those different patterns are going to complement each other. So that would be my tip on presenting to an interior designer. Yeah, that's a Kim great- and Ebony, I have a question for both of you. In yeah. terms of a flat lay, would that, so if somebody as a surface pattern designer doesn't have the skill set yet to use Photoshop to like create that vignette, flat lays. do you, do you like looking at flat lays? Yes. Okay. And, and flat, I, flat lays are great for Instagram. And I, you know, I don't do flat lays because I, I just don't do pretty flat lays, but, but pretty flat lays get tons of traction and they're, mm -hmm. a, they're so pretty. And I look at flat lays all the time on other designers, um, Instagram. And I'm like, Ooh, who'd they use? And I like scroll in to see who, who, what textile was used for their flat lays. Yeah. I and somebody that. is asking, oh, I'm sorry, Ebony, please. Go no, ahead. no, 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 no. I'm, I'm in. Oh, what's a flat yeah. lay. Yeah. So yeah, we, they're asking what a flat lay is. Go ahead, Kim. Oh, uh, why don't you go Ebony? I'll try and find a flat lay and then oh, I'll try yeah. and hold it up. Oh yeah. So it's just like a, a flat lay. So you putting all the materials that materials that you're going to use in your project and you just, making it pretty like on the on, on like a flat surface so basically that's what that is yeah yeah, like yeah and the then you take a photo or, looking yeah. down yeah they're kind of like, like a and fun to put board. together <laughs> yeah and it, it's kind of like a mood board and sometimes people will add like a little um flower on top of it so they'll add like three-dimensional things sometimes with like a piece of mm -hmm. tile or something that's more interior design but if you are doing a floral and you're inspired by the daisy maybe go pick a daisy and lay it over um you know some of your things or whatever you're inspired by it could be like hard metal or you know a cool watch even or a cool piece of jewelry that maybe you know just be creative with it you guys are all creative because clearly you're on here so um it's just something that displays different pieces of yours in a very beautiful um, display. And it's usually taken from above and it's laid flat on a table. And that's why it's called a flat lay. So I do a lot of flat lays like starting off, but now it's like 3D yeah. renders. <laughs> yeah. 3D renders you said, Ebony? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, 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 I, but I do, I, I like the, the flat lay, the aspect, like you get creative and make it beautiful. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very tactile. Yeah, just I just from the artist side, which is lovely. <laughs> I just saw how many patterns do you think? I would say probably at least four to six, probably um, or more. But I think that maybe you could do a minimum, but no less than three for sure. But if it's a three, then you're probably going to need other elements on that flat lay to make it interesting. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, what they say, pair it in three. So maybe six, shoot for six if you can. I don't know, yes. Shelly, is that unrealistic? <laughs> So I guess it depends on how large your flat lay surface is. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, if if you want to put, I know in the surface pattern world, uh, I recently learned that they call them hero prints, which is like your main beautiful, more bold statement print. And then, so maybe you lay that with some of the coordinates. Another thing that interior designers find very important for their use is that any pattern that they pick of yours, they will want to know if you have coordinates Mm -hmm. because they might need to do trim on something. So maybe they put like the Danica Herrick pattern that's in Kim's image behind her on the wallpaper. Maybe they want to do that above a chair rail and then below they want a different wallpaper, but they don't want it to not coordinate. So, and she probably wants it to still come from Danica Herrick. So Danica would pick another coordinate. Maybe it's a stripe or a solid with a subtle texture or something. So just know when you're thinking about creating some collections, which is super important for marketing to interior designers, you almost have to do collections because they're going to want back and forth prints that work with each other. Great. Um, and so we're talking, you know, about selecting designs for a flat lay or as an interior designer, looking at an artist's flat lay and selecting from that or selecting from a portfolio. But of course, you also may find artists on platforms like Spoonflower and be kind of weeding through all of those designs and selecting from that. And Ebony, as you mentioned, 
you know, you recently did a project with Spoonflower, utilizing Spoonflower for Vogue Room Foundation. And I'm wondering if you can talk about how you chose those designs um, from the platform. Oh, man. <laughs> I went through like 200 pages. <laughs> <laughs> You're thorough. <laughs> Seriously, like, I mean, literally, um, you know, I was shopping for wallpaper, bedding. And so I went through the whole Rolodex. Um, so, you know, that's like 200 pages. And I mean, from that, you know, as I saw things that captured my eye that I thought that would be great for the dorm students, um, I'm mean, sorry, the college students, um, you know, I just kind of compiled a folder of those items. And then from that folder, that's what I presented them with. And, um, you know, and they loved it. And so like this one right here is like the salmon graffiti wallpaper and quick story with that and, Ka um, and Catherine is on here. So it's like two days before the student moves in and, you know, we, we have this th this pattern in peel and stick wallpaper because, you know, put it on the cinder block walls, we're good to go. But the university say, hey, you can't have anything on your wall. You can't have wallpaper. You can't have fairy lights. You can't have anything. And so, Catherine, we come up with a plan that okay, let's just like, we can get the, we can get the pattern in fabric. So we're just going to do fabric. Now, mind you, I never put fabric on a wall, but literally that's fabric on the wall in that picture back there. And so, um, but yeah, like I, I, I love Spoonflower, tons and tons of um, patterns and prints that you can choose from. Even the headboard, that's literally, um, we purchased the, the headboard, but wrapped it in the fabric um, of that headboard and the Spoonflower. Um, but yeah, I love it. And and so, you know, like with this collaboration with Surface Designers, hopefully next year I can work with someone specifically on a, a on a dorm room project. So yeah, Shelly. Um, <laughs> I got that. So, <laughs> this panel is creating a lot of opportunity for between yeah. Shelly, Ebony, and Kim, and I am loving it. Um, and for everyone watching and listening and participating in chat when Ebony's talking about Catherine. It is Catherine who is sharing links in chat. So shout out to Catherine for some quick thinking with Ebony on that project. Yeah, to make it come favorite, together. Yes. Yeah. There was uh, a question that kept popping up that I had seen. Um, folks were wanting to know the cost between a surface pattern designer and interior designer when they're working on a collaboration. And there is really no straightforward, quick answer to that. Um, I probably do it differently than other people do it. Uh, my own personal choice as I continue to grow my own business is that for interior designers specifically, I do custom colorways or simple changes free of charge. Now, if that grows into like a giant beast, then I will have to charge something if it's too overwhelming. Uh, if a client wants something fully custom, which I have done in the past, I do charge an hourly fee and I let them know ahead of time what amount of time I estimate that it's probably going to take. And as we go through the process together, I'll do sketches and if it starts to creep up or go over, I will let them know ahead of time so that there's no shock at the end when I need to bill them for my time. So I'm sorry, there's no like dollar value that I can give you as an exact number, but it really depends on the artist, their own needs, because we have to pay our bills just like anybody else and your time and what time you have and the designer. Yeah. And maybe Kim, if we can dive into this a little bit deeper, we have um, a variation on this in the Q&A from Iris. As an interior designer, how do you manage the contract and payment side of that type of project when you're working with an artist on something custom, something bespoke that wasn't something you found in their portfolio or on Spoonflower? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think it's kind of going back to what Shelly um piggybacking on her, I think it's, everybody's going to do something differently. And so it's just an open communication um, with the, the interior designer up front. And so a lot of times it'll be like, well, how much will this be? How many hours, you know, is expected? Or do you have a flat rate? Um, is this something that we can just tweak a pattern that you already have, like maybe add some dots just to give it a little bit of flavor or something. So I think it depends on that. Um, the other thing that interior designers also deal with is we we deal with project budgets. And so that's that's the other thing 
too, is that we need to, we can go to the client and we can say, we're looking to design this custom piece for you and it's going to be in this range. Are you okay with it? And so if we can get approval, then we can move forward working with the um, surface designer on creating a custom piece. So that's kind of how the process works on our end. We always need to make sure we're within budget. So we get paid too. So it's just kind of that chain reaction. But Having clear communication, making sure you're charging what you're worth, um, um, you know, and so and so that would be my answer for that. Yeah, that's great. It um, you just automatically addressed another question we had, which was great from Diana about like the importance of setting clear expectations up front for something like that. And I think that that's that's great. Yeah. Um, oh. I didn't, I didn't know if I had heard someone popping back in to, to jump in. Um, let's see. We have a lot of really fantastic questions in the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to try to get to some of these in our last 10 or so minutes. Um, let's see. Ebony, you talked a little bit about how you chose the designs for Vogue Room Foundation, um, and you chose about you know, black and white being popular for you. We have specifically, Regina was curious, what other types of designs and colors are you tending to look for right now when you're selecting designs from surface design artists? I um, really don't have like a color. It just like whatever stands out to me, you know, it's, it's really no color in mind, just like what I like, you know, just kind of depends on the day, <laughs> seriously. Um, I mean, I, I love color. I'm a fan of color. So I'm always open, you know. Awesome. Um, I think this is a nice, which we've, we had a session this morning all about trends, but I think trends become even a little bit more niche when we get to interior design. So maybe we can explore trends a little bit since we have several questions about what colors you're choosing and things like that. Um, so maybe Kim, you want to expand on this as well. Just some, some trends, some colors, some styles that you go for. Yeah, absolutely. So I think in the world of interior design, textile design, surface design, there's so many different styles. So I think it, being true to knowing who you are as an artist is key. Um, looking for inspiration in magazines, Instagram, people that you follow that are in alignment with what your aesthetic is, is also key. And studying that for, for trends. Um what I am seeing, so, so I, I said that, but <laughs> what I am seeing is that I, I have found that I love, for me personally, I love the textiles that aren't just, um, the patterns that aren't just like red and then fully colored in red. I love the little bit of movement. So I don't know what you call that in terms, I'm sure that y'all are going to have a ton of you know, side marks that know that term, but where you kind of like watercolor it in the background and it's kind of like graded. a faux texture. Yeah. Something like that, like where it's just brush strokes or it's a little bit looser and it's not just so like, like here's a bird and it's red, you know, it's outlined in black. So I like the, the ones that are a little bit looser, um, for me personally. Um, and so, but I also like super, I don't know. So even if it's like very distinct, but just like the colors got a little bit of a modeling effect. Um, I also like um, where the background's not always white. So think about like, if you have a pattern, like, can you reverse that to put color on the background and then lighten up maybe the pattern inside? That's kind of fun too. Um, and also again, have the background modeled and not just like purple. Um, which I am seeing trending right now, by the way. I don't know if y'all are seeing purple trending. It's super, oh, yes. <laughs> super fresh, but I think we're going to start seeing a little bit more purple. Purple and green is pretty. Purple, green, and orange is a pretty combination. So um, I don't know if that helps, but color it's is coming back color. though. Thank God. Uh -huh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Monica awesome. Herrick does a whole presentation. I don't know if it's part of the Spoonflower archives, where she shows surface pattern designers how to overlay texture, like a faux texture effect onto their, their patterns. And I think that's what you're talking about, Kim, is like a more painterly, yes. uh, handcrafted kind of effect. Yes, that's exactly, exactly. 
Yeah, I believe actually in last year's symposium, so about a year ago, <laughs> Danica did a workshop um, about elevating your work for home decor. Um, so if all of you watching, check out the Spoonflower blog for last year's symposium replays. You can see, I believe, the workshop that you're talking about, Shelley. Awesome. Um, along this idea of trends from LK in the Q&A, what about children's designs? Um, as interior designers, Kim and Ebony, are children's designs something that you look for and use regularly? Or do you find that, you know, your market really geared towards more adult grown-up spaces? And Shelly, from your artist point of view, um, are you seeing a market for children's designs? Mm -hmm. I Shelley, actually, <laughs> I actually have quite a few interior designers purchase uh, more kid-centric prints from my shop, uh, like my doodle dogs. And um, I've got some like retro board game kind of themed prints that people are really liking. And I think for me, it's not necessarily kids, but it's nurseries, uh, especially expectant mothers want their nurseries to be beautiful spaces. And a lot of them will share their photos on social media as well. So I actually have a lot of finished photos of some of my prints in wallpapers in nursery spaces. So maybe thinking about that versus like elementary school age kids, but I'm sure either way is fine. Awesome. And, I'll, and I'll just be um, honest. I, I don't get a lot of clients that spend a ton of money on kids spaces as much. Um, but I do know that when looking for kid friendly, you know, inspired kind of designs that they're not as readily available. Um, so I feel like the market is smaller. I mean, the, the saturation of the market is smaller in, in that niche. And so I think that there's definitely room to expand if, if you're interested in that as a surface designer, but I don't, I get more people wanting to invest their um, resources, finances into more public rooms or more adult rooms. Yeah. And Ebony, you obviously work, um, you know, in dorm room design for that project. So, which, I mean, these rooms that are like, I want to live in that room behind you. So it's definitely not a kid's space. It's a very stylish young adult space, but I'm curious if kids children's design comes into play in your work at all. So not really. Um, I feel like now, I mean, I've, I've been to five baby showers this year. So, um, <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> so, so, so I, I see it in the future, but, but as of right now, no. Yeah. 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 I feel there that's are maybe... some, there Go are ahead. some design studios out there that are 100% solely for kids spaces. So if you Google search uh, for kids room or kids space interior designers, they do exist. They are full blown studios. And maybe that's your resource that you want to send swatches and little goodies to in a box or something to help get them on board to your designs. Awesome. I'm seeing a lot of questions in the QA around scale, scale guidelines for home decor, a lot of questions around recommended scale for wallpaper. Um, so Shelly, I'm wondering if you can take this first from the artist perspective. When you're thinking about designing for wallpaper, what kind of scales are you thinking about? Sure. Uh, so what I've noticed as a trend on my own Spoonflower shop is that designers will, they tend to select my larger scale prints and then sometimes, but not always, we'll come back and just ask if I can rescale it smaller. So if I don't already have that same listing as a smaller scale, I'll just create one for them, send them the link, and then they'll purchase it. But because people are shopping online from Spoonflower, I think that those larger scale images are what pops out first and really stands out to the designer. And so they see that as a statement piece and then they'll purchase the swatch based on that. So I always try to make sure that my artwork has an appropriate DPI for scalability. And uh, also in the Photoshop thing yesterday, I learned that you can set your scan settings on your scanner to uh, be able to blow up your, your artwork larger. So the tricky thing is making sure that your own images aren't pixelated when they print out because you don't wanna offer something large scale and then have it be really poor quality. I have had a few of my own listings that that's happened to, so I've pulled them and redone them. Um, but it, I think the large scale really is what draws people in initially. And then from there, they'll select an appropriate scale once they get the real life sample. 
Awesome. Yeah. And Ebony, from your perspective, what types of scales are you looking for on wallpaper versus home decor? Yeah, so definitely large scale to uh, Shelly's point. Um, that's what the clients tend to gravitate towards because sometimes when we do a smaller scale, you put it on a wall and you kind of get dizzy, you know, sometimes. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm a fan of the the larger scale prints. Awesome. And Kim, I saw you nodding along. So I assume- 100%. <laughs> yeah, that's the power pattern, you know? It's like, what, what's going to be my impact pattern? Who's going to be take the star of the show? And, and as designers, we're always thinking about like, how can we get our work published? Like sometimes works can take up to a year um, or more to complete. And so we really want to get traction with that. And so creating that like high drama, high visual impact, and really it's, it's, those large scale patterns that are really going to do that for you. Great. I would also say that interior designers, including myself, loathe patterns that you can see like a square or a rectangle of the repeat. So yeah. you, you want something that kind of flows and blends within the room. Or if you have like a geometric print or something like the bees that are behind Jesse, obviously that repeats fine. But if you're trying to create this unique repeat but then you can tell where it starts and stops designers are not going to select it yeah. i was going to ask you about that shelly so sometimes in the 3d rendering when it comes to the repeat that's where it gets a little tricky because it doesn't read really well when you know when it comes to that repeat so yeah i, I understand what you're saying <laughs> yeah um, um well we have just two short minutes left with you all. This has been such an informative session. I'm going to try and squeeze in one last question um, before we go. And that is, we've been sharing a lot of tips and advice, but is there anything, um, are there any pitfalls that we as artists should know about when it comes to entering the interior design field? Anything that we should be cautious of, look out for, mistakes that we might make? Um, Shelly, I'm wondering if you want to tackle this question first. Um. Honestly, I am of the mindset that jump in with both feet and just learn as you go because you're never going to be able to fully mitigate all of the problems that are going to happen in the future by trying to address them beforehand because something will always happen that you didn't expect. So happy accidents, like Bob Ross says. <laughs> so um, I think just just go for it. Keep learning. Keep growing keep talking to other designers, including interior designers and ask them what they're looking for because they are your client at the end of the day. Yep. And Kim, did you have something to add to this as well? Well, I don't know if it's exactly that as far as pitfalls go, but what I would say is don't be afraid to reach out to the, if you know a designer is using or, if, or, or your work, um, your artist, ask them to share share it with you, even if it's just nothing but sending you the photos of it. First of all, we love sharing, like we get so excited, like, look how good your pattern looks in this room. So we love doing that. Most do, we're all not all cut from the same cloth, but also like ask them to share it on their Instagram, ask them to, you know, don't be afraid to reach out. We, cause we're artists too, and we totally get it. And sometimes we have so many vendors that we're that we might forget and it's not super intentional because we we might have had 65 vendors that went into that one room but if we know it's important to you please feel free to reach out to us and the other thing too and i and mentioned this when we were doing our pre-panel discussion um reach out to designers through email through text through mail um, and be consistent. I get like 60 people trying to make connections with me every day, but be consistent, especially when you see somebody that has a genuine, you can tell like you guys would be a good match. If they say no 10 times or they ignore you 10 times, keep going at it. Um, you know, and eventually if it's meant to be, it's going to stick. And um, I know that I love using vendors that I create a true connection with. And um, so that's why that's what I have to add in closing. Awesome. I think that is some great advice, I think, to, to end on just to jump in with both feet, to remain consistent, to reach out to those who you know you're a good fit for. And that absolutely sounds like a recipe for success in a way that we can all jump into this. Um, we can have the best idea as well to send uh, handwritten thank you cards to designers who purchase your product. I was like, oh my gosh, I need to be yeah. doing that. And I don't know why I'm not. 
<laughs> yeah. And you can, have them pre, you can have them pre-written, you know, and just add a little oh, sentence in the, yeah, like take, take 10 and do that. And then I would also say like, like eating an elephant, take small chunks at a bit, right? Like just study like one or two designers and maybe, you know, you send out mass emails to multiple designers, but hone in on one or two per month and that you make multiple connections with like through text, through, through email, like not just all through email because we get so much junk. And so if you could find our number somehow and reach out to us that way through a text, send some images because we're visual. Um, that's awesome way to connect with us. Awesome. Well, this was amazing. Kim, Ebony, Shelly, thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise. And I'm just personally so grateful that you all were able to be here and join us today. Well, thank you for having thank us. You. Of course. Mm -hmm. And everyone watching, whether you were here for just this session, for all six of our symposium sessions, uh -huh. thank you so much for making this another amazing event. There has been fantastic questions asked in Q&A, amazing conversation in the chat throughout the last two days. Um, I'm feeling super inspired. I hope you are as well. Um, if you've learned anything, if you've been doodling, if you've been creating alongside of this snap a picture, share it on Instagram and tag Craft Industry Alliance and Spoonflower. We're really excited to share some of those things on our social media and um, just keep creating. Hope to see you all on Spoonflower and thanks for another amazing symposium. Have a great weekend, everyone. Mm -hmm.